first slide. I see that. Yeah, I'm. I'm just going to okay. look at my presentation and then just um, do it that way. <laughs> All right, we're we're live now, so I'm going to go ahead and welcome Mount Sinai High School students. We have a very informative presentation for you today. You might want to take notes and make a to-do list. You can get any questions you have answered at the virtual college fair after school today. Make sure you check that out. And let's welcome our presenters. We have Lisa Hansen from Seton Hall University, David Martinson from High Point University, and Richard Clear from the University of Oregon. All right, go ahead. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to just, we wanted to just introduce ourselves really quickly, and then Lisa is going to be uh, sharing a little bit about Aero, the organization that we are with presenting with today. So I'm David Martinson, Senior Regional Admission Counselor with uh, High Point University, and we are located in North Carolina, but I am based in Washington State. And now, Richard, why don't you introduce yourself? Hello everyone, my name is Richard Clare and I have the privilege to serve as the admissions counselor at the University of Oregon and I am based in Eugene, but I um, I'm the representative for Washington State. Great. And hi everybody, um, my name is Lisa Hansen. I represent Seton Hall University. I'm the assistant director of admissions for the West Coast region. And so I cover a lot of states, including the Pacific Northwest area for Seton Hall. Great. And then Lisa's going to share a little bit about Aero and what we do. Absolutely. So Aero um, is a wonderful regional organization. It, uh, the acronym means Association for Regional and Representatives of Oregon and Washington. So we are all excited to serve you and your families. Um, we put on a lot of great events, including mini fairs at high schools, which we're going to be doing uh, in a little bit this afternoon, and all age uh, also, college information workshops, um, case study events. We also do luncheons for the counselors, etc. So lots of different events that your um, or community can participate in. Okay, students. This is an exciting time of year where a lot of you who are juniors, rising seniors, are really starting to really embark upon this exciting college search process. So we wanted to just share some kind of like key terms with you that, you know, you will be considering such as academic programs, locations. There's a variety of wonderful institutions here in the Pacific Northwest, but maybe you have some relatives or you visited the Northeast part of the United States or even the Southeast part of the United States. So just in a few moments, we're going to share a really, really unique tool that you can use to help craft your college search list. But as you're embarking upon this journey, you know, academic programs, um, if you're a student who's considering engineering or maybe you want to pursue a humanities or social science, social science based um, major, those are some things you need to consider as you're looking at the respective institutions. Student life is very important. What are some ways that you can engage beyond the classroom setting to really have some of that peer um, and support and collaboration beyond the classroom? Campus visit, a lot of institutions are opening up their respective institutions so you and your families can plan accordingly for visiting um, your institutions you're considering this, this summer leading into the fall. But before I show you, share this really unique tool that you can use to kind of help create your list, um, Lisa's going to cover some kind of like some you know unique terms that you'll, you're going to encounter as you begin this college search process. Lisa? Great. Thanks so much, Richard. So some of the buzzwords you're going to hear as you are going to different college fairs or high school fairs, um, things like that, some of the things you're going to be aware of to ask questions about student to faculty ratio, which is important to know um, what it, uh, how, in, in, how personalized is your educational environment going to be. The acceptance rate, and one thing I want to note um, when you take into consider ac acceptance rate, Keep in mind that that does not mean a university is better or worse than the other. It's just a, it's just a term. It's good to know, though. But that's a, probably a question you're going to be asking is how many students that apply are accepted, the percentage. Retention rate, how many students that uh, enroll in your particular university are going to stay there all four years. That's an important um, statistic as well. And scholarships, are they renewable? Do they go all four years or do they end after one or two years? That's good to know. Completing your FAFSA is always good a good um, thing you're going to be aware of as you get ready for the financial aid discussions. 
any kinds of scholarships, whether they're merit-based, um, which means they're based on your academic performance during high school and maybe your SAT or ACT scores, although many of us are going test optional, um, and super scores. So we'll get to all of these terms um, during our presentation in more depth, but these are some buzzwords you might want to be aware of. Okay, young scholars, as I mentioned, this is a really unique tool that you can really leverage as you really begin this college process. It's called bigfuturecollegeboard.org. And Dave, if you can go to the next slide, this is a great way for you to really do specific searches for institutions that you're considering. So as you're creating this list, I really want you to really think about what are some features that you're looking for in a college or university? And I say college university because some institutions carry the name college, but they also carry, carry university in their name. So just be conscious of that. It doesn't mean that it's a two year or four year institution always. So as you're serve, utilizing this tool, as Lisa mentioned, a lot of institutions are test optional. So you can do specific searches based on test scores. Is this a permanent change? Meaning for those students who are applying for fall 2022 admission and beyond, will I be required to submit to, to, to official SAT and or ACT scores? Type of school, are you looking for a medium, large, or small institution? One of my favorites is the sports and activities. What are some of the, you know, opportunities that the institutions offer for you to continue to pursue the interest that you have been actively involved in in high school or other ways that you can get involved in some interest that you may develop when you're in college. And this could be the performing arts. This could be experiential learning opportunities, internship opportunities. What is a way that you can really enhance your undergraduate experience? And then also academic um, profile, academic credit. A lot of students that I have the opportunity to work with in Washington State specifically participate in the Running Start program. Most institutions, including my peers here today, my colleagues here today, they accept what we call like dual enrollment coursework credit and also credit earned through the advanced placement, international baccalaureate. So there are some things if you enrolled in Running Start or if you are pursuing the IB diploma, those are some things you want to consider um, looking at as you consider it. Um, paying for college, and that could be scholarships. Every Most institutions offer some form of merit-based scholarships that students have to meet academic requirements. So um, those are some things you want to take into consideration as well. And another favorite um, feature that I like encourage students to look for is student support services. What are ways that I will be supported both in the classroom and beyond? So if a student has an individual education plan or a 504, what are some ways that um, your institution offers accommodation services? And it also could be um, something that's if you're a first generation college student, meaning your parents did not earn a college degree, this is a great way to really tap into uh, peer um, support beyond the classroom through those various support services. So I would definitely encourage you today, take, a, take an opportunity to utilize this tool as you're creating that, that college search list. Next slide. And I mentioned, you know, when you're considering uh, medium, you know, large or small institutions, these are just a few examples of what constitute a medium to large institution. So with the institution's respective size comes different opportunities to um, for engaged learning, experiential opportunities, study abroad programs. So you'll know what is a good fit. My encouragement to you is when you're creating your college search list, Maybe add a couple, you know, schools from these various um, school sizes on your list and go visit those institutions to see if it'll be a right fit for you. Okay. And then as you're forming your list and deciding where you're going to apply, what you want to do is you want to have a range of schools that you're applying to. You don't want to get to spring of next year of your senior year and not have anywhere to go. And so you want to make sure you apply to a range. And so based on your profile, your GPA, if you're going to be submitting test scores, you can do searches and even uh, look up the colleges that you're interested in and find out what is their average GPA? What are their average test scores? You can find out um, a little bit about their admit rate. How many students are their acceptance rate? How many students do they typically accept into their class? And then you can decide, okay, is this going to be a likely school where this is going to be pretty easy for me to be admitted to this school? Is it a good match where it's right on my, my average GPA and my test scores match the school pretty well? 
Or is this going to be a reach school? Is this going to be a school that it might be a little harder for me to get into, but I'm still going to, to try for it? And so you want a range of schools that you're applying to and also a range of schools regarding being able to pay for it, being able to afford it. So it's always good to have, yes, some private schools, um, some public schools on there, in-state, out-of-state, a variety of schools. So you have some options in regarding uh, how much they cost, perhaps how much scholarship or financial aid they give, and then also um, how likely is it for you to be admitted to that school. Now, there are some schools in the U.S. that are so selective. When you get under 15, 20 percent uh, selectivity acceptance rate, that's always going to be a reach school for you. OK, so you don't want to have your whole list full of those schools. You can have a couple on there is fine. Have a range of schools that you really like that are a good fit for you, um, but that are perhaps a little more accessible for you based on your academic profile. So this is going to be based on each person, each student uh, making your list and making sure you have a backup plan and some good schools on there that you really like, but a range of selectivity as well. OK, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about your admission counselor. We as admission counselors love interacting with you and are a great resource for you. So once you develop your college list, OK, these are the five to eight schools, right, that you are wanting to apply to. Reach out and find out, look on their website and find out who is your admission counselor. Normally, you can find out territories on there and you can see, OK, this is the, the, the counselor for Washington State. I'm going to email them. I'm going to introduce myself, let them know I'm interested, and then ask them questions. If you have questions about visiting campus, if you have questions about programs, a, a major, right? If you have programs about financial aid and scholarships, they are your go-to person. And so you can uh, reach out to them. If you have a campus visit coming up, reach out to them and say, hey, can I schedule a meeting with a professor? And many times that admission counselor can help be a go-to and actually help schedule a meeting with a professor perhaps. And so we are a great resource for you to ask about our specific colleges, but then also if you want general in information or general advice, contact us. And we're happy to talk about, about just general college um, admission uh, help that we can give you. We like to visit your high school Hopefully, it'll be in person. It might be virtual, but it might be in person this coming fall. We like to go to college fairs. Uh, and I know we have a college, a virtual college fair coming up this afternoon. So we love to share information about our colleges, and we love to help give you information um, uh, and answer any questions that you might have. So your admission counselor, you need to get to know them. And if you get to know them, maybe even do an interview with them if, you, if they allow interviews. When they read your application later, if they, if they are reading your application, then they can put a name with a face if you've been able to meet them in person or do a, a virtual call with them. It's great to get to know them personally through that process. Okay, and then Lisa's gonna talk a little bit about uh, types of applications. Thanks, David. So the types of application include many that you might have heard of, um, Common App, um, now, over 900 colleges and universities uh, have, have uh, adopted the common application. Um, it's one app. Many times you can apply to many schools on the common application. So it's good to use that if you can. There is also another application called the coalition application. So this is a little bit um, more, uh, not as widely used as the common app, I should say. And um, there are certain members that use this application. If, if you look it up on the website, you'll be able to see what institutions might be using the coalition app versus the common app. Um, I believe that all of us that are presenting to you today use the common app, so that's good news for you all. And um, also a university might have their own specific application. So that's another way you can get to know your e admissions counselor and you can al always use their specific application as well. The last thing I wanted to say is, as far as we're talking about applications is to make sure to ask your admissions counselor or the university if they have an application fee waiver. Because appl if application fees can really add up quickly and many times the admissions counselor will be more than happy to provide you with an application fee waiver. 
And then the next slide co covers a lot of the application components. So what are we looking for in an application? Most of us do a very holistic review, especially at the smaller universities, but many universities also do holistic review. What that means is we look at all the components, the high school transcripts. So we're looking at your academic performance while you're in high school. We look at the test scores. Again, I mentioned many of us are going test optional for at least um, some indefinitely and some for just a few years down the road, but test scores can matter uh, whether or not a school is test optional. You want to know that in advance as well, because you might need to check a certain box on the application if you are applying test optional or not test optional. Um, other builders on your, on your application that you will include, your essay, which we're going to get to, resume, um, you can include, and also letters of recommendation normally coming from one or two, one or two teachers or uh, definitely your uh, college counselor. And also your um, perseverance, you might want to mention in your essay, but um, Letters of recommendation really vary from university to university. So again, a very good reason for you to be in touch with your admissions counselor. And then these are some of the admissions deadlines that you'll want to be aware of. So some schools uh, employ an early decision date. What that means to you as a student applying is if you apply to an early decision school, you're basically telling that school, if I get accepted here, I'm coming. And you are guaranteeing that you're going to enroll at that school. So it's important that you only really consider applying to one of those schools um, because it is considered pretty a serious um, decision on your part. Early action, much more common. Many, um, many universities have early action deadlines and many, many times university counselors will tell you better to apply early action so you might be able to be considered for additional scholarships or, uh, you know, the highest rank, rate of scholarship um, if you apply earlier rather than later. Regular decision, typically this is going to happen in the new year. So early action generally is November, December. Early irregular decision is usually in February, March. Um, rolling admissions means you can apply anytime. So some, some schools actually start accepting applications as early as August or September. So be aware of that in the schools that you're putting on your list. Purpose of the essay. Boy, we could go into a lot of um, conversation about essay. I know we have a couple slides on this, but just very quickly, the purpose of the essay really in the application is for us as admissions counselors to get to know you better. We can read through your application. We can see what kinds of activities you've been involved in and uh, what great students you are through your uh, GPA. But the essay really gives us another snapshot into who you are if we're not able to meet with you either virtually or in person. So really um, take the time to brag about who you are. Maybe take a great um, example of something that happened to you that really impacted your life. Um, but there are many, many things we could say about essay development. So I will go over this pretty quickly. Thank you, Lisa. So going back to um, earning, you know, advanced credit uh, throughout high school, and this could be in the form of earning start, advanced placement, international baccalaureate, Cambridge. Um, this is a great way and it serves as a positive indicator when we're evaluating your application that you're taking advantage of your high school's most challenging and demanding curriculum. So this, this is going back to what David really emphasized. Be intentional about asking your admissions counselor I've, I've taken advantage of dual enrollment or AP credit in high school. How does that transfer um, to your respective institution? Knowing that, you know, how that's going to transfer early in, in, in the application process will give you more of a, a general idea of, OK, maybe I can graduate a semester or two early. Um, but it's very important to communicate, you know, uh, what you've earned through Running Start, dual enrollment, AP or IP. How many um, and how will credits be be considered? Most institutions take if it's advanced placement or three or higher. So every institution has kind of like a, a chart um, that you will be able to access on their on their on their website to to get an idea of okay, I've earned a four on my AP language and literature exam. I'll get such and such credit at this respective institution. Now, for students who are enrolled in a Running Start who are interested in, in applying to University of Oregon. As our slide says, you are required to apply as a first-time freshman. 
However, if you enroll, um, depending on the amount of credits that you um, transfer to the University of Oregon will determine your class status. In addition, one more comments. We do have articulation agreements um, with several of the community colleges in Washington State. So depending on which, if you are a part of the Running Start program and you come in with an associate's degree, you have met several of our general education requirements. But this is again, going back, ask your admissions counselor how those were transferred to their respective institutions you're considering applying to. Okay, great. Thank you, Richard. Now here's a question to consider. Why go out of state? And I know Washington has some great schools, um, uh, state schools and also private universities and colleges in the state of Washington. Thinking outside of state gives you so many options. Um, there are some cases where some universities might have impacted majors, and that means that it might be hard to get the classes you need in order to graduate in a certain major. Um, and there's so many colleges around the U.S. There's over 3,000 colleges in the U.S. And so you might also be looking for a specialized program. You might be looking for a program that is very particular to a certain university uh, in the U.S. For example, you might be interested in flight science. You want to be a pilot. Not too many universities offer that, but there are some that offer that in the U.S. And so that might be a reason why you might be going out of state to, to study at a specialized program. Another reason why it might, it might be scholarships. It might be affordability. Maybe you get some great scholarships from a college um, back east or in the Midwest or in the south, and that's a reason why you might want to be considering going out of state. It's also exciting to spread your wings and go try something new. And so if you've, um, you know, if you're born and raised in Washington, want to go see the world, want to go see the U.S., get out there and go to another state, another city. It's exciting to get out there and just experience something new, experience independence, um, maybe being a little farther away from home and to just spread your wings and, and you know, have that as an adventure. You can always come back to Washington uh, after graduation if you want to, to work or go to graduate school. So you can always come back to your home state, but it is, it is exciting to go out there. And, uh, and a lot of our universities around the U.S. have awesome internships and, and, and companies maybe that are, that are um, not in Washington that you can have access to. And also it gets, it gets you out and it gets you, as I said before, learning about a new city or state that you've never known about. And the U.S. is a fascinating country, so much great diversity around the, the country. Um, small, some of these colleges and universities are in remote towns, tiny towns towns out in the middle of nowhere. Some of them are in the, in, the, in the middle of a major metropolitan city. So that's part of you deciding what is the best fit for me. And so as you think about out of state, you might have a city that is like, this is my favorite city I would like to go. Maybe there's a college there that you might want to check out uh, and a great way to get to know that city by going to that college or university. And um, again, spreading your wings, gaining independence, being a little farther away from home, you, the nice thing about flights is, you know, you can fly across the U.S. in about six hours, and so it's not too bad uh, to go even back east to a school and, and still be able to, you know, with video chats and, and text and phones and so forth and coming home to visit when you're able to. But it's very accessible. So we encourage you to think broadly and think about the options of going out of state. Okay. And then um, Lisa's going to share a little bit about this next, uh, about WUI. So some of you might have heard about WUI at this point in your uh, college search, but what it means, uh, just very quickly, WUI stands for Western Undergraduate Exchange. It's pronounced WUI, so it's kind of fun to say. Next slide. And, and then I think one of the things that, just to kind of go over the details of WUI, um, again, it's, it's, uh, it's coordinated by the uh, Western Interstate Commission of Higher Education. So WUI, what it provides is a regional tuition reciprocity. Um, so students that are coming from one of these following states you'll see on the next slide um, can participate in WUI. So the slide, the uh, I think it's a two part um, slide, David. Oh, there you go. Um, so these are the states that are included in WUI. Um, if you are a student in Washington um, or Oregon, or you know, especially in the Pacific Northwest, but lots of students um, from the Western region, 
can look into WUI schools that are in these other states. Not all institutions are part of WUI in these uh, different states, by the way. Um, and of course, students um, that are considering schools on the East Coast, um, you would not be looking at WUI um, opportunities there. But just to give you an idea, you can always look up more information about WUI. Um, one thing you want to remember, having worked at a WUI school before, um, is that it's a great opportunity. Students pay just you know a little bit more than in-state students. So usually it's around 150% of what in-state tuition students pay, which is a fabulous op um, uh, opportunity for students. But some students think that this counts toward gaining residency in that particular state. And to my knowledge, it doesn't work that way anymore. I think it did for a time. So if you're looking to gain in-state tuition, you do uh, need to check with your admissions counselor at those universities and find out what that might entail. OK, great. Yeah, so WUI is a great option for you to, um, to have a, a lower tuition in many cases and to be able to go to a great school. So if you want to look that up, definitely. So the, the point of this next slide is, scholarships and financial aid and you really want to have a conversation with your family um, you know with your parents your guardians about about paying for college have, have a conversation with them now even before you enter your senior year and find out okay what are we looking at you know do we have some savings that have been set aside to pay for college um, do we really need to or do we really need to be focused on you know, schools that offer a lot of scholarships, financial aid, um, maybe schools that cost a little bit less. And so maybe WUI might be a reason to consider the WUI schools because the tuition is going to be lower. And so have a conversation with, with your family. Um, every year I have conversations uh, at my college and then before when I worked at other universities with students who get super excited about going to a college, but then later on they start thinking about paying for it and it can be difficult sometimes, um, you know, making that happen. Private colleges, uh, state colleges, state schools, there's a lot of options to help with financial aid and scholarships. So a lot of schools offer merit scholarships. Uh -huh. And that is going to be based on usually academics. A lot of schools use it on GPA. Sometimes they'll incorporate test scores into that. Sometimes they'll even offer a special scholarship. If, for, if you're like an Eagle Scout in the Boy Scouts. And so you need to contact your college that you're interested in and look up their scholarship and financial aid information page, email your admission counselor, and ask about options for scholarships. Some colleges will consider you for a scholarship just by applying to their college. Some of them don't have any extra applications, but some of them might have a scholarship application, or maybe they might even have an interview that you need to go through in order to uh, apply for a certain scholarship. Um, I know some schools have like a presidential scholarship. And so, you know, to get a, to apply for a presidential scholarship, you might have to come to campus, go through an interview, maybe fill out a special application. Some of these scholarships can be pretty big. Some of them can be full tuition scholarships. Some of them might be five or ten thousand dollars. Some of them can be up to full tuition. And so really reach out to your admission counselor to find out. Um, and some of them even have a calculator on their website a net price calculator or a calculator on the website, if you put in your GPA, some of them might even give you, and, and maybe your test scores, some of them might even give you an idea of how much scholarship you can expect. And so you can go looking on websites once you have your college list and look for that. And then also uh, need-based financial aid. So the merit scholarships is based on how well you have done as a student. It is not determined by what your financial need is from your family. And so when you fill out the FAFSA, the Free Application for Federal Student Aid, that's the form that you would fill out for most colleges to apply for need-based financial aid. And that opens up on October 1st of your senior year. You can start filling the FAFSA out and submit it. There's going to be information sent to the college. And they're going to be telling the college, this is how much um, – is expected of the family to pay, the EFC, that expected family contribution, and this is the need that's left over, how much the family needs, how much money the family needs still to be able to afford to come to your college. Now, some colleges are able to meet full need and say, yep, 
we are able to cover the rest of it in grants, and that's free money. Grants and scholarships are free money that you don't have to pay back. So some colleges say, yeah, we're going to meet that. Other colleges say, we're going to be able to give you some more help toward your, uh, toward your uh, you know, cost of attendance to come to us, but we're not going to be able to cover the full amount. And so you need to go into it knowing that you might still need to come up with some money. Even if you get a full tuition scholarship, which is great, you might need to still come up with some money to pay for room and board, you know, the dorm and, and the, the meal plan, for example. And then also books. Even if you got a full ride scholarship, right, and they're paying for everything, you might need to still have some money for books. And so I would encourage you now, talk to your family, start saving some money, even if it's for books, right? So you start saving some money now, and so you have a little money saved up. And then you're going to be applying to some colleges. You're going to be applying for financial aid if that's important to your family, submitting the FAFSA. And then once you get around to next spring, you might be comparing financial aid award letters and saying, okay, which school is offering me the most aid? Or, you know, this school I really, really love, is it possible for us financially to afford it? Now, beyond the FAFSA, there are some schools that require you to submit the CSS profile. It's another form that will give the college a little bit more information on you, on your family, and your, your financial situation. Okay, So if you might want to ask your admission counselor, what is needed to um, apply for need-based financial aid at this college? And they'll tell you the FAFSA, or they might also tell you the FAFSA and the CSS profile. So this is just a tiny introduction to this. Reach out to your admission counselor, ask them a lot of questions about this. Scholarships and financial aid is a big thing. And then there are outside scholarships. There are other organizations around the US that can provide other scholarship opportunities. And so one of one, um, one great website to go to is fastweb.com. It's here on the slide, fastweb.com. There's also um, some other websites here as well, washboard.org, um, where you can search for other scholarships, outside scholarships that you could perhaps add to a financial aid package at that college or university where you're applying. So this is kind of like drinking from a fire hydrant today. We don't expect you to remember all of this stuff. Just know that there are options to help you pay for college. Reach out to your admission counselor once you have your college list. Reach out to them and get more information on what they can help to provide you uh, with financial help. Okay, then I'm going to be doing this one as well. Visiting campus. It's so fun to go visit a college campus. Hopefully, more colleges are going to be opening up where you're going to be able to visit them in person. I know some colleges are doing on-campus tours right now, which is great. Some of them might be doing virtual. So the bottom line is... It's hard to attend a college if you haven't seen it in person. Now, some people do it, some people do it, but it's hard to do that because you don't get a sense of what, are the, what does the full campus look like? Talking to the people on campus. How do you feel when you set your foot on that campus? What is your general feeling of being on that campus? Those are all important things. Maybe you're able to meet with a faculty person, a, a professor, or a, some maybe maybe uh, you know if you're interested in club basketball, right? There might be even uh, someone that you can talk to about that. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do during a campus visit. Usually, a campus tour is a big thing, and then me maybe meeting with an admission counselor in the admission office. Some some colleges incorporate that as part of the campus visit. It's a great way for you to talk to them, ask your questions. Ask your tour guide a lot of questions. Most tour guides are current students. They're living the life there at the college. So ask them a lot of great questions. What is it like to study here? What do you do on the weekends for fun? Uh, ask them about whatever questions you have in mind. Also, some colleges offer open house events throughout the year. And so maybe you might have a college coming up in the fall that has an open house. You can go there to their campus and you can actually um, maybe have some information sessions, talk to some faculty, uh, get a tour. That's a great way to get to know more about that college as well. And maybe you can do a tour. So if you're going to, uh, to a certain state, for example, or even staying in Washington um, and you have a few colleges that you're interested in, go and do a tour. Take a week, maybe spring break. Um, well, that could be a little late for next spring break, maybe during the summertime. Take some time during the summertime and take a few days and actually go and, and visit some colleges so they're kind of close to each other so you can maximize your time. 
and then there's a lot of virtual events. We are all doing virtual events. It could be virtual information sessions. You could be doing a virtual campus tour. And those are kind of fun where you uh, go to their website, click on virtual tour, and there's like a little tour guide usually that'll walk you around the campus and show you different buildings and talk about campus life. That's a great way if you're not able to fly somewhere or drive somewhere right now to go to an on-campus tour, that's a great way to get to know a little bit about the campus by doing a virtual tour. Um, if you don't really know yet if a big college or a small university, a college is, is right for you, wherever you live, I know you guys are here in Washington State, go, go take a couple tours at local universities, maybe a small college, a larger college, and see how you feel on the campus. That might help you a little bit in determining what kind of a university might be a good fit for you based on the campus feel, how large the campus is, and so forth as well. Okay, let's continue on. All right. As you guys are, you know, be going through this process and entering senior year in the fall, it's important to create a checklist. I always encourage, as David has emphasized and we've emphasized throughout the program today, really use your admissions counselor as a resource, but also use your guidance counselor and or your college and career advisor. They're there to help you um, navigate this college search process with confidence and with all of the resources that you need to make an informed decision. So as you begin applying to institutions, a lot of schools, um, you're eligible to begin applying for admission August 1st. You know, be sure to um, ask the teachers and or guidance counselors that you want to write a letter of recommendation on your behalf. Make sure that the schools you're applying to, um, they don't require to self-report high school coursework and grades by completing the self-reported academic record. If not, you'll need to request your official high school transcripts to be sent to, um, to those respective institutions. So as you begin senior year this fall, be sure to create this wonderful checklist and, you know, be able to ask your admissions counselor questions of like, you know, deadlines, um, maybe some majors that you're considering have a separate application deadline you need to be aware of, in addition to um, some merit-based scholarships as well. Next slide, David. Okay, sorry about that. So this kind of just give you a geographical, you know, um, you know, idea of where our respective institutions are located. And again, when we began our you know program today, we talked about location. You know, where do you foresee yourself going and really exploring, you know, for your college education? So the University of Oregon, we are located in Eugene. We are this Oregon's second largest city. We have about 150,000 residents, beautiful area, like most places in the Pacific Northwest students. Eugene is a beautiful place for outdoor recreation. It's we would have an amazing weather this year. We are considered a large institution. So of our students, we have about 19,000 undergraduate students. So we really focus on undergraduate education, undergraduate student success. Of our 160 academic programs, we offer majors, minors, concentrations, and certificates across nine schools and colleges, which includes some of our professional schools like the Lundquist College of Business, our School of Journalism and Communication, School of Music and Dance, and also our wonderful top-ranked Robert D. Clark Ernest College. If you're interested in learning more about the University of Oregon, we offer amazing programs across all respective academic disciplines. I'd love to connect with you. Okay, great, thank you. And I'm just gonna, just quickly, I know we're almost out of time, share a tiny bit about High Point University. We're located in High Point, North Carolina. We're a private university, about 4,600 undergraduate students. We specialize in experiential learning and life skills. And we have a five-star restaurant on campus as part of the meal plan. It's called 1924 Prime. Four years guaranteed graduation, four years guaranteed internships, and four years guaranteed housing. We have division one sports, a lot of fun stuff to do on campus, and we are named number one in best dorms in the U.S. right now and number nine most beautiful campus, according to Princeton Review. Okay, and then now Lisa. So Seton Hall. Seton Hall is located in South Orange, New Jersey, which in case you're not familiar, we are basically a suburb of New York City. We're only 14 miles away and a short 30-minute commute into Manhattan from our campus. Um, we, we are mid-sized school, just over 6,000 students over 90 different great programs you can choose from. We are known for uh, outcomes. So we are ranked number four in the country for internship opportunities. Over 80% of our students complete between three to five internships before they graduate. So they get uh, access to great employment once they're, they're graduating. We're among the top 25 universities in the nation 
with the highest paid graduates, mid-career earnings 50% higher than the national average. But we have a lot of different programs to offer you at Seton Hall. I know we're running out of time. We are doing, we're test optional. We are, we are doing on-campus visits as well as virtual. So please, I hope you can come visit. Okay, I think we're gonna pass it back to the high school and uh, thank you so much for allowing us to be here. All right, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your expertise with us. Um, students, our advisory lessons will cover a lot of the information that we've gone over, so you don't have to stress. We'll provide more information. And the college fair starts at 2.45 today, so make sure you're at the college fair to get some more questions answered, but we're here to support you. Thanks again, everyone, and have a great day, Wildcats. Thank, thank you. you. Goodbye.